Good morning, my name is Sergeant Paul Spinella and I am a correction sergeant at the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office. On behalf of Suffolk County Sheriff Dr. Errol Toulon Jr., I would like to welcome you again to the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office second annual Executive Leadership Conference. To kick us off this morning, we would like to welcome the president of Hofstra University, Dr. Susan Poser, who has graciously invited us to host our conference here in the Sandra and David S. Mack Student Center on their beautiful campus. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Susan Poser. Good morning and welcome to Hofstra University and to this very important leader, uh, conference about leadership. Uh, I want to really begin by thanking all of you for what you do because it allows us and other universities and other organizations everywhere to do what we do. So uh, we're really delighted to have you here today and I also want to do a shout out to that really wonderful rendition of the national anthem. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Um, I want to give a special welcome uh, to Sheriff Errol Toulon, uh, whom I had the pleasure to meet and talk with last month. Uh, you have an absolutely extraordinary leader uh, in, uh, in Dr. Toulon. And I also want to uh, do a shout out to Hofstra's, and I want to emphasize Hofstra's, uh, Jerry Hart. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the former Suffolk County Police Commissioner, of course, and now the Associate Vice President for Public Safety and Community Engagement uh, at Hofstra. We are so fortunate to have her here, and I saw her greeting everybody and hugging them, and I just want to emphasize that she's at Hofstra now, and she's staying. Um, I looked at some of the questions that you will all be discussing uh, and the people who are speaking over the next couple of days, and it looks like you're really in for a terrific conference about leadership. Um, if you had asked me about 30 years ago, you know, about the importance of leadership, I would have said, well, I don't know, just do your job. What's the big deal? Uh, but of course, soon I learned uh, that leadership is absolutely everything in an organization, and it needs to exist not just at the top, but throughout the organization, everywhere. One of the key lessons that I have learned over those years is that the quality of the leadership is absolutely key. And by quality, I mean everything from how consistently and in what friendly manner you greet your staff every morning uh, to your approach to making those very tough decisions and, and weathering um, the heat that follows, and also to what you talk about and signal as your priorities for the institution. These make an enormous difference in the success of the organization. Those signals from the top uh, wherever the top happens to be in that particular organization or what subunit of that organization, those, go, those signals go through the organization uh, like lightning and set a tone and a culture uh, among people that you don't even know, but I guarantee you they are paying attention. So I want to thank you again uh, for choosing Hofstra University to hold this important conference, um, and I wish you a productive uh, and enjoyable next couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, President Poser. I would now like to welcome to the stage your host for the Executive Leadership Conference, our leader, the ruler of the rink, the chairman of the boards, your friend and mine, America's Sheriff, Dr. Errol Toulon, Jr. You just avoided going on midnights with that introduction. <laughs> There's a quote, a true leader has the confidence to stand alone, the courage to make tough decisions, and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. He or she does not set out to become a leader, but becomes one by the equality of his actions and the integrity of his intent. Many individuals ask me, you know, why did you want to create a, a leadership conference? And one of the things that I realized, especially when I became a deputy commissioner with the New York City Department of Correction, is that there is no preparation for any role when you ascend to the highest levels of any organization. How do you deal with the media? How do you deal with staff? How do you deal with unions? How do you deal with the people you're supervising? How do you communicate effectively? And how do you take care of yourself? No one realizes that when you're at a higher level in the organization, the stress that you go 
uh, you have every single day, whether it's through personal interactions or just the interactions of the, of the job that you have. I was not prepared. I, I can tell you, when I walked in as a deputy commissioner in 2014, it was pretty much do what you think is best. Within a week of assuming your position, I was the acting commissioner for a week because the commissioner went on vacation. Very, very difficult and challenging times for me. And I said, you know, who is my support system? You know, yes, we have other deputy commissioners, we have chiefs, but what happens? They only know the organization that they've worked in for 20, 25, or possibly 30 years. And so it's very, very important for me and very, uh, f to have an, an opportunity for us to all get together, discuss the challenges that we all face every single day, and how do we communicate, and more of a networking opportunity to really bounce things off of. I really want to thank Dr. Poser and uh, Hofstra University for allowing us to, to uh, host this conference here. Uh, my friend, and I'm sure everybody's friend, uh, Jerry Hart, she's still a commissioner to me. Uh, thank you very much for even, you know, thinking of this opportunity for us. It gives a lot of our partners that live uh, so far west uh, the availability to attend this conference. And I really hope that you, you get something out of each potential speaker that's here. There is something in each individual that is so unique, and the experience that they're going to be talking about is something that I feel invaluable. And I personally, even though I'm, I'm now in my 40th year uh, in law enforcement, looking forward to hearing everybody speak, and hopefully I can become a better leader. So God bless all of you, and thank you very much. Thank you, Sheriff Toulon. Our first speaker today is Rohan Murphy. Rohan Murphy is a Paralympian, wrestler, and motivational speaker, and the founder of inspirational networking community Catch Spark. Murphy, who lost his legs at birth, started wrestling his freshman year of high school. He is one of the most decorated wrestlers in East Islip High School history. After a successful high school career, he went on to Penn State University, where he wrestled for coach Troy Sunderland and earned three varsity letters. He also began participating in Paralympic weightlifting events and won a bronze medal in the junior division of the 2006 IPC World Powerlifting Championships in Busan, South Korea. Murphy is now a professional motivational speaker who speaks on a wide variety of subjects, most notably overcoming adversity and accepting differences. Rohan's life story is a gripping tale of adversity, dedication, and living life with a purpose. Please join me as we welcome Rohan Murphy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for having me. How you guys doing today? Good. Oh, thank you for having me. Much appreciated. It's great to be here. Once again, my name is Rohan Murphy. I am now a youth motivational speaker from right down the road, East Islip. And today, I'm here with you all to share my story and tell you how I overcame not having legs. But with that said, I'm going to start from the very beginning. And unfortunately for me, I was born with a very severe birth defect that left both my legs deformed. And usually at schools, kids always ask me, well, what do you mean deformed? Well, when I was born, my kneecaps were on the opposite side. When I was born, my legs were backwards. Unfortunately, my doctors really didn't have any answers for my parents, and my parents took it really hard, especially my mom, because she kind of blamed herself. But anyhow, I went on to live life those first couple years with the formed legs, and then finally at the age of four, my parents and doctors decided that it would be best if I had my legs amputated in hopes of someday, maybe around middle school, even high school, get prosthetic legs, walker prosthetics. So at the age of four, I had my legs amputated, but I had some complications through surgery, and I required five disillusioned surgeries afterwards. So as a kid, I spent a lot of time in the hospital, a lot of time at home trying to recover from using surgeries and procedures, and for the first couple years, I was even homeschooled. But then finally, in third grade, like any other kid, I began to attend school. And that first day of school back in third grade, <laughs> that's when it hit me. That's when I truly realized that I was different. Because when I first started going to school, there were just so many things I couldn't do on a daily basis that all my friends and classmates were able to do. And a big thing for me at that point in my life, when I was a kid, was the ability to play sports. Because as a kid, I loved sports. Always had a little natural passion for sports. I think that love and passion for sports came from my father, Noel because he named me as a fate athlete when he was a kid. 
The first one was a cricket player by the name of Rohan Kanai, and my middle name, Mario, came from his favorite soccer player, Mario Kempes. And that's how I got my full name, Rohan Mario Murphy. But obviously, if we don't have legs, you can't really play too many sports, like travel soccer, little league baseball. And at a young age, I never thought that I would ever be given an opportunity to play competitive, able-bodied sports. But thankfully, that all changed back in middle school, back in eighth grade, because of one person, because of one teacher, my eighth grade phys ed teacher, Mr. Ron Croto, a coach, as I called him. And you see, most students in schools don't really know or believe that the teachers and administrators in their schools have that ability and that power to truly change their lives for the better. But trust me, believe me, they do. And that's exactly what Coach did for me. See, Coach realized, once again, by not having legs, obviously, I couldn't play most sports now, like soccer, which he was coach of at a middle school. So Coach was nice enough and kind enough to make me a team manager for a middle school soccer team. And by becoming a manager for a middle school soccer team, I would go to practice every day, I would go to all the games, I would help take stats and attendance. And finally, for the first time in my life, for the first time, I was actually a part of a sports team. And I had such a good job being a manager for a soccer team during the fall, the very next season during the winter, Coach once again gave me that same role as manager, but this time for our school's wrestling team. So I became a manager for the wrestling team as well, did a pretty good job help, helping them out with the team. But then one day, towards the end of the season, Coach says to me, Ro, 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 I have a great idea. I asked him, Coach, what's that? He says, Ro, I've been doing some thinking, and I think you could wrestle. I think you could somehow go out on that mat and wrestle kids with legs and be a wrestler, Ro, like anyone else. And I asked him, right, Coach, but if I don't have legs, how in the world could I wrestle? He said, it'll be easy. He said, I'll have to somehow wheel myself out onto the mat, jump on the mat, grab kids' legs, and take them down. And I told him, you know, Coach, huh, thanks and no thanks. And I told Coach, wrestling wasn't for me. I told Coach, I was just happy to be the manager. But the thing about Coach, what really made him great, what really made him special, uh, not only as a teacher, not only as a teacher, but as a person, Coach did not give up on me. He did not give up on me. He was just so persistent. Finally, one day at the school, he got a hold of me, literally. He brought me down to the practice room, and he started really showing me and demonstrating me how I could wrestle, how I could take people down, how I could pin people, even without legs, and I couldn't believe it. Finally, I found a sport that I can do. I found a sport that I could actually play. I told him, my coach, you know what? I told him next year while I'm in high school, ninth grade, I'm gonna somehow, I'm gonna try a high school wrestling team coach, and I'm gonna somehow make the team just for you. He said, all right. So of course, now I had to go home and I had to talk to my parents about it. But my mom did not want me to wrestle. She was so worried about me getting hurt, getting injured. And she said to me, Ro, you're going to be out there wrestling kids with legs. You're going to be at a huge disadvantage. Aren't you worried? Aren't you afraid that you're going to lose a lot? I told her no. I told her no. I wasn't afraid to fail. I wasn't afraid to lose. I just wanted to really try the sport of wrestling. And if the sport of wrestling didn't work out, then so be it. I just wanted to try it. My parents finally said to me, all right, Ro, go ahead and do it. And that good year came and they just that, went up a high school wrestling team. And that first practice back in ninth grade, it was huge. It was probably the most important in my life because if I was going to somehow going to really go out there and be able to compete against kids with legs, I couldn't wear those prosthetic legs. I couldn't wear those fake artificial legs that I wore every single day when I was younger, whenever I would go somewhere in public, whether it be the mall, the movies, and especially school. Now, why did I wear those fake legs? Well, I wore those fake prosthetic legs because still, at that point in my life, I was just still so embarrassed, so insecure, so ashamed about being different, so ashamed about not having legs, so ashamed about being disabled. But I finally said to myself, you know what? I have to be who I am. I have to be Rohan Murphy. I have to live my life to the fullest. And hopefully, hopefully, all the kids in my school, and especially all my new teammates on the wrestling team, will be kind enough, will be kind enough to embrace me for who I am. So I went inside the first practice anyhow. I willed into that practice room. I took up my prosthetic legs, hopped in my wheelchair, crawled out the middle of the mat, sat down, and I was looking at all of my new teammates around me. And I was terrified. I was so afraid that maybe someone was gonna make fun of me, bully me, because once again, because I was just so different. But something that practice happened, which amazed me, that I'll never forget. Something amazing happened. All my new teammates, all my new teammates, every single one of them came up to me, one by one. They shook me, they shook my hand, they looked me in the eyes, and they said to me, Ro, it's great to have a wrestling team. We're gonna have a great season. And for the very first time in my life, for the very first time in my life, outside my own family, I felt acceptance. And I felt I belonged somewhere. 
And I always try to emphasize the kids that I want them, not only while they're in middle school for those three years, not only while they're four years in high school, or even their four years in college, but for the rest of their lives, for the rest of their lives, I want all of them to be more inclusive, be more inclusive, not exclusive. Be inclusive in life, not exclusive. And for me personally, you know, speaking at middle schools, high schools, asking all those kids, students to be more inclusive to me, that's not an anti-bullying stance. Speaking to all of you adults here today, asking you to be more inclusive as well, that's not a liberal stance. Now, to me, being inclusive in life, that's a human stance. So once again, let's all try to be a little bit more inclusive in our everyday lives. But anyhow, back to that first practice. My coach says to me, Rogue, I'm going to show you some wrestling moves. I'm going to help you win some matches, and we are going to have a great season. I told him, my right, coach, let's do it. And I went on to wrestle anyhow in ninth grade, my very first year wrestling. And that first year, I didn't do too well. I'm not going to lie to you guys. That first year, I finished with a record of only 2 and 13 on JV. Two wins and 13 losses. Not very good. But after that year, I started to really think to myself, what if I could somehow overcome this? What if I could somehow, despite of all of this, could really become successful, could become successful in not only wrestling, in not only wrestling, but in school and life as well. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be remarkable? Wouldn't that be extraordinary? So after that first year, ninth grade, I started working really hard in sport, trained really hard over the summer, went to a simple four-day wrestling camp, came back in 10th grade, improved a lot, made a varsity team in 10th grade, and I finished a year in varsity with a record of 25 and 6. So in this one year, I went from 2 and 13 to 25 and 6. But still after that year, winning all those matches, I wasn't really happy. I wasn't really satisfied. You see, for me, good just wasn't good enough. Good just wasn't good enough. I want to be better than that. I want more to life. I always wanted the best for myself. And I want to be not just good, but eventually, I want to become great. After the season, I even went to a team awards dinner, and my coach was nice enough to give me the team award for most improved wrestler. I remember sitting there holding that big award, that big trophy, and my mom was sitting right next to me, and she asked me, Ro, what's wrong? Why aren't you happy? Why aren't you smiling? I told her that I don't want this award for most improved wrestler. I don't want this award. I want the other one. I want the award for MVP. I want the award that said best wrestler. So at that dinner, I had a little meeting, meeting with my coach, and I asked coach, how can I somehow get to the next level in sport of wrestling? How could I somehow, once again, go from good to great? He said, bro, this summer, why don't you try going to wrestling camp? Maybe not just one camp, bro. If you want, maybe try going to two, maybe even three. I told him, all right, sure. So I went home with my parents anyhow. We did some research on camps from all across the country. And most of the camps were pretty similar. Three-day camp here, four-day camp there. Nothing really stuck out to me. Then I found, found this one camp that was pretty unique, that was pretty special. It was called the J. Robinson 28-Day intensive wrestling camp, which was held all the way out at the University of Minnesota. Did some research on the camp, found out that all the wrestlers would go there, all the kids would go there, wake up every single morning bright and early at 6 a.m., work out for 45 times a day for 28 straight days. I told my parents, oh, this is perfect. This is exactly what I need. Not for wrestling now, but for life as well, because it was around this age, I was beginning to really look at colleges. And growing up as a kid, when I was younger, I basically had three goals for myself. I had three goals. Two of them was to somehow find a sport that I can play, which I found in the sport of wrestling. But the second goal was that someday after high school, I wanted to attend a big university. I wanted to live on a big college campus independently by myself, like any other college student, and someday earn a degree and graduate from that university. And for me, that was a big deal because growing up disabled, <laughs> don't get me wrong, I was very lucky, very fortunate, I have a great family, great parents, but my parents, especially my mom, were very, very, very overprotective. I guess you can see as a kid, I was pretty sheltered. To give you an example of that, growing up, whenever my class at school would go on a field trip to say the Empire State Building, Washington DC, Frost Valley, my parents, or my mom I should say, would never allow me to go. She would never allow me to attend because she was so afraid that something bad would happen to me. So I finally got the point in my life when I told my mom that it's just, it's just time to let me go. It's time to set me free. I had to figure out if I could be independent. I had to figure out if I could someday live on a college campus by myself and take care of myself once again, like any other college student. Thankfully, anyhow, my parents agreed to allow me to go to this camp at the University of Minnesota, and this campus changed my life. 
It really gave me a different perspective on things, like how much hard work, dedication, and sacrifice was gonna take me great. And some of those workouts at camp that we had to do as wrestlers, some of those drills, as they call them at camp, that we had to do as wrestlers, they were pretty tough. They were pretty challenging. Let me give you an example, one. So at camp, we wake up every single morning, bright and early, 6 a.m. And usually, we would have a running practice to begin our day at 6.30. And since I didn't have legs, most of the time, I would just do laps around the track by myself in my wheelchair. But this one morning, my camp counselor really wanted to push me. He really wanted to, he really wanted to challenge me. Challenge me, not just physically, but challenge me mentally as well. My camp counselor happened to be a guy by the name of Brock Lesnar. You guys ever heard of Brock Lesnar? Who is he? WWE wrestler, UFC heavyweight champion. So one morning, Coach Lesnar brings me down inside the middle of the track where there's a football field. So Coach Lesnar says, Ro, come down to this one end zone. And I did just that. He says, Ro, hop on a wheelchair, which I did for him. He then says to me, all right, Ro, I want you to somehow for me, try walking down to that end zone in a handstand, 100 yards, 100 yards in a handstand, all the way down. He then says, Ro, when you get down to that first end zone, how about you try doing a pyramid of 10 push-ups? Try doing a pyramid of 10 push-ups. Then after all that, he says, Ro, after all those push-ups, try walking back down another 100 yards, another 100 yards, back down to the first end zone. And initially, I thought the coach was kidding. I thought he was joking, but he wasn't. And I was up for my life when I would just do anything to improve. I would do anything to make myself not only a better wrestler, but a better person as well. So I did for coach 100 yards, just like this. And I'm not gonna lie, I was, I was struggling. I was tripping, I fell down a couple times, like so. But I finally made it down to the 50 yard line, made it halfway, finally. And I was struggling, like I said, I was having a tough time. And Coach Lesnar surprised me. Coach Lesnar told me, Ro, you can stop and come back. Coach Lesnar told me that I had to finish the workout because it was so difficult. But I told him no because I was the type of person that when I start something, I'm gonna. So 100 yards, just like this, all the way down. Finally made it down to that coach. Finally made it down to that first end zone for Coach Lesnar. He then says to me, all right, bro, now try doing those push-ups. And as you all know, a pyramid attempt push-up isn't just one, two, three, four. It goes something like this. One, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, nothing to it, right? All right. <laughs> so finally, he then says to me, all right, Ro, it's pretty impressive. You made that look easy, but trust me, it's not. He says, Ro, how about you add about five to 10 clapping push-ups and come back down? What's a clapping push-up? something I did anyway <laughs> just to prove them wrong and prove to them that I could be successful Whew. no matter what usually when I speak at schools this is when they clap you know <laughs> yeah. but like I said growing up I had three goals I told you two of them. I told you two of them. Play a sport, and then someday at the high school, graduate from? College. 
a great, well-known university. And one day, back in high school, I had a meeting with my guidance counselor. I'll never forget. We were in his office, going to different schools, colleges, universities. My parents were there as well. I told them, my first choice, my dream school, was Penn State University. Penn State, a school that was great academically, great school academically, but a school with also one of the best, if not the best, Division I wrestling programs. I told my guidance counselor, I want to go to Penn State. I told him, I want to wrestle for Penn State. But most importantly, I told him, I want to someday graduate from Penn State University. He said to me, Ro, Penn State, that's a great school, bro. I knew I got the grades for it, Ro, but Penn State, I don't know what's right for you, he said. He said, Ro, that's a huge campus, 45,000 college students on one campus. He said to me, Ro, wouldn't it be too much for you? Wouldn't that campus be too big for you? How do you get around by yourself? He also, told me, he also told me that it snows there a lot in winter, and believe me, it does, because Penn State is up in the mountains. It snows every day during winter at Penn State. He says, bro, if it snows so often at Penn State, how do we get to class on your own? And I never forgot that. I never, ever forgot that. To make a long story short, though, yeah, I went to Penn State. <laughs> and I graduated from Penn State University. And just in case, if you're wondering how I was able to get around campus, get to class on my own at Penn State when it snowed during those winters, simple. I'll just call campus security, have them pick me up, and take me to class. <laughs> Easy does it. And back to that camp anyhow, I think I impressed Coach Lesnar by doing a workout across the football field. Why? Because Coach Lesnar made me do it again. Great guy, huh? And the very last day of the camp was pretty special. The very last day of the camp was pretty special. The 20th day of wrestling camp, the last day, before each wrestler was allowed to leave, before each kid was allowed to go home, each wrestler, each kid, simply had to run a marathon. Simple, you wake up that morning, you run your marathon, then you leave, you go home. But the thing about the marathon that made it different was that for the very first time at camp, for the very first time at camp, each wrestler was given a choice. Each wrestler was given a choice to run either five, 10, or even 15 miles. Take a while, guess how many miles I chose to do in this wheelchair. Well, it was honestly probably 16 or 17 because I got lost on the way home. <laughs> but the point is, just like all those kids at that camp, we all have a choice in life. We all have a choice to be either average, good, or great at whatever you choose to do. For most kids that I speak to at schools, it's a favorite subject in school, maybe a favorite sport like wrestling, art, dance, music, theater, whatever it is. They all have a choice to be either average, good, or great. My hope is that after hearing my story, not only those kids, but you're, you guys as well, you guys choose to be great. You choose to get the most out of life. You always choose to be personal best. Because as we all know, we ain't living twice. We got one life. We got one life. So you might as well make a count with or without legs. And and I came back from that camp anyhow. I did pre-well in high school wrestling. Once again, after high school, I attended Penn State University. And when I was in college at Penn State, I decided to go off a Penn State wrestling team. So one day, I had a meeting with a Penn State wrestling coach in his office. I went up to his office and knocked on the door. Coach answers, big smile on his face. And I told him, Coach, my name is Rohan Murphy, and I would love to be part of the Penn State wrestling team. He looks at me and says, sure, Ro. He says, great. He says, Ro, how about you become one of our managers? You can help us take stats for the matches. You can help us videotape the matches. Be one, be one of our helpers, he said. Be one of our managers. I told him, coach, no. I said to him, coach, I want to wrestle. I want to be on the Penn State wrestling team. He says to me, well, Ro, if you're in a wheelchair and if you don't have legs, how could you wrestle? I told him, it's hard to explain, but I can show you. He says, all right. So I took him down right in his office. <laughs> Coach says, right, that's enough, that's enough. And coach gives me a try for the Penn State wrestling team. And our very first practice of the year was something a little bit different. As you all know, wrestling is more of a winter sport. And this is late August, beginning of the school year. So we had a preseason conditioning workout where all the wrestlers on the team, all the guys on the team were going to run up a very tall, steep hill. It was actually a ski slope right outside the Penn State campus. And I just remember now going to this practice, looking at all my new teammates around me, watching them get warmed up, stretching out, getting ready to run up this tall hill on their feet. I said to myself, man, 
if I'm gonna make the Penn State wrestling team, if I'm gonna be successful in non-collegiate wrestling, fun life as well, I can never, ever use this as an excuse. I can never tell someone I can't do this workout because I don't have legs. I can never tell someone I can't spend the after high school, go to college, and graduate because I'm disabled. No, no. My life motto, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. It's called no excuses. No excuses. You want something out of life? Go get it. Go earn it. Go achieve it. So after my teammates started rumbling the hell on their feet, I followed them. I followed them on my hands. Through the dirt, through the grass, through the gravel. It took me about an hour and a half to make a cup that hill. About an hour and a half. But I did it. And I finished it. Why? No excuses. And I once heard Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. say, wherever you're going in life, you should fly there. Get there as fast as possible. And don't you ever let anyone or anything stop you. And if you can't fly in life, you have to run. And if you can't run, you have to walk. And even if you can't do that, like myself, you have to somehow start with a C. You know, a lot of people look at me. They say, man, that guy was born without legs. That's tough. He was dealt a bad hand in life. I feel bad for him. He was dealt such a bad hand in life. But I'm fine with that now. <laughs> I really am. Because to me, just because you're dealt a bad hand in life doesn't mean you have to fold. Doesn't mean you got to give up. You got to persevere. You got to keep on going in life. You see, I'm a true believer in that every single person eventually has to overcome something. Every single person eventually has to overcome something, has to overcome some type of hardship, some type of struggle, or maybe even some type of adversity in life. And adversity, as you all know, being adults, adversity comes in many different shapes and forms. For most of the kids that I speak to at schools, it's maybe watching their parents go through a messy divorce, maybe growing up in a single parent household, maybe watching their family struggle financially, or maybe even something pretty unique and extreme, like not having legs, like myself. But I tell them, man, if I could overcome this, and if I could live a great life, and be successful, why can't they do the same? What's holding them back? What's stopping them? At the end of the day, what's gonna be their excuse? Thank you for your time, guys. Really appreciate it. Have a great conference, all right? All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. All right, all right. Before I play a video, time for Q&A, questions. All right. <laughs> People always ask me, what's the biggest difference between speaking to kids and adults? Kids have no filter. <laughs> they ask me anything and everything. So I'll break dice by saying this. A lot of kids ask me, Ro, if you have legs for a day, if you have legs for a day, what's the one thing that you'd love to do? Honestly, that's a great question because there are a lot of things that I would love to experience with legs. A lot of things I'd love to do with legs. Maybe go for a walk on the beach during the summers here on Long Island. That would be great. Maybe try playing different sports like a football, soccer, whatever have it. That would be amazing as well. I've always been really fascinated with swimming, though, as a kid. I always wanted to go swimming. I could never do that. But anyhow, if I could choose one thing, you know what I'd love to do just once in my life? Just once in my life, I'd love to do. I'd love to simply be able to go somewhere in public, like the mall, the movies, Times Square, just walk around and just know and experience what it's like. Not to have every single person stare at you. Just once. Just once. What I'm trying to say is, I don't think we all realize how fortunate we are and how blessed of lives that we have. Do not take your lives for granted, people. Do not take your lives for granted. All right? So with that said, anything from you guys? Thank you for uh, speaking. Uh, Brett Lang and uh, Sarah Small. Uh, very uplifting, very positive. Um, were there times, though, that you felt like throwing in the towel and giving up, and did 
because you just sound like you've always had a good grip on it and no excuses and that sort of thing. Or there are times that you, you've really felt like giving up and how close have you come to, you know, the, the dark times, you know, and what you did to get through those. Yeah, you know, growing up, I had a lot of dark times, especially when I was younger, but I always had hope. I always had hope in myself. I don't know where, the, where that came from. It might be just intrinsic, just who I am naturally as a person, but I always knew deep down inside that I could succeed in whatever I wanted to do in life. Whether well, let's go to a great college like a Penn State and graduate, uh, compete in a sport of wrestling. And even now as an adult, I, I said I had three goals. I told you two of them, play a sport, graduate from college. But the third goal was when I became an adult to live independently by myself. And yes, I'm able to live independently on my own just now as an adult. So I always had hope in myself. I always believed, always believed. Having still pursued whatever he wanted to pursue before his uh, accident, if you would call it that. Have him pursue what he wants to be great at in life. You know, when I told my story, that eighth grade phys ed teacher who changed my life, he didn't just get me into a sport. He gave me a purpose in life. He gave me a purpose, something to strive for, something to really look forward to every single day after school. And I'm a true believer in that in life it all starts with a purpose. You get your purpose, you build a passion for it, you get your passion for it, you get different perspective in life. And I think we all have to go through this process. That's why I call the three Ps, you know, purpose, passion, perspective. So definitely help him find his purpose in life. Just like my eighth grade phys ed teacher helped me find mine in the sport of wrestling. It all starts with a purpose. It all starts with a purpose. A lot of kids ask me, Ro, how do you drive? How is that possible to drive without legs? Simple, I use hand controls. So my vehicle to lift with a steering wheel there's a lever that I'll pull towards me for gas, push away for brake, and on the steering wheel itself, there's an object I use to steer with one hand. So when I drive, it looks as if I'm playing a video game. But, uh, and sometimes when I'm driving with my friends and want to have some fun, if we get to a red light and there's someone to the left of me, I'll make eye-to-eye -eye contact with that person and I'll turn around my seat like this. <laughs> you should see their faces telling you it's great. Anything else, Violet? Way in the back. I believe you said it was ninth grade that you had to turn around in life due to the coach or teacher. Yeah. It was to influence you and to help you. Would it be better today for people in uh, kindergarten, grammar school, up to junior high, do you think they have better opportunities today that you didn't have? The teachers then weren't as aware or enlightened? Oh, uh, no, not at all. I think the kids today uh, are just like kids were when I was growing up, uh, especially if you're in a great school district. Yeah, um, that's one of the things I've noticed, but speaking of different schools, I mean, it really makes a difference where you go to school, unfortunately. Yeah, it's just the way it is. Thankfully, I grew up in a great town, great area, great school district, East Islip, where we had a lot of great teachers and people that actually cared about us. So I definitely owe my, uh, owe my success to the adults in my life growing up as a kid, without a doubt. Today, they might be a little more inclined to encourage I didn't get that to ninth grade because of my disability, you know? And that eighth grade phys ed teacher, him having that idea of me wrestling without legs is pretty, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> pretty extraordinary, yeah. I, I wouldn't expect every teacher to think that as well, you know? A kid without legs could go out there and compete against kids with legs. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely out of the box thinking. So you speak to a lot of kids in schools, and since COVID, have you been back to schools? And do, do you think that kids, like, have you noticed a change in kids since being out of school for those couple of years for COVID? Yeah, I think they appreciate it more now. Mm -hmm. I think the kids that are back in school now definitely appreciate it. I know it's hard for a lot of those upperclassmen to lose their uh, last couple of years, especially with sports in, in high school. You know, most kids at the high school don't play sports in college. So I think the kids nowadays definitely appreciate being back in school after COVID and they're not taking that for granted. I just 
home for one more comment, bro. I think you should have your picture in Stanley's bakery right next to Boomer Sison. <laughs> Boomer Sison, EI legend, I don't know. I don't know. That'd be a tough one. Thank you, though. Appreciate that. Anyone else? All right. I'll play a video for you guys. I have 20 minutes left. Uh, a couple years ago, I was featured on ABC's 2020. It was my seven minutes of fame. Literally seven minutes. Hope you guys enjoy it. And thank you again for having me. Much appreciated. Oh, and if you have any social media, please follow me, at Rohan Murphy. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Thank you. Now that we've roused your sense of wonder, we're going to rev it up with some inspiration. It comes in the form of a young athlete who has turned his feelings of teenaged inadequacy into a triumph of spirit and body. Bill Ritter has the seventh wonder of the night. This is Rohan Murphy doing his daily workout. I mean, really, how to look like this guy? Those arms, those shoulders, that chest. Exactly how strong is he? Well, talk about superpower. Rohan can bench press nearly three times his body weight. No shocker that he's a certified physical trainer at the Gold's Gym in his hometown of Islip, New York. In fact, Rohan is such a magnificent physical specimen, you can almost forget the one thing that truly sets him apart. He has no legs. Was there ever a point where you said, you know, dang, you know, why me? Yeah, definitely. I think when you're a kid, you, you just want to be just like all your friends, and unfortunately, I couldn't be like all my friends. I couldn't go out for bike rides. I couldn't play sports with them, you know? That was heartbreaking, but I just had to overcome that. What Rohan had to overcome were birth defects. No hip on one side, half a joint on the other. His legs never worked until they were amputated when he was four. For cosmetic reasons, he sometimes wore prosthetics. His fingers were also defective. They were surgically separated when he was five. Suffice it to say, Rohan was different, and it wasn't easy growing up. I, I really just didn't want to accept being disabled, you know? Whenever somebody would ask me about my disability, they would, they would come up to me and say, hey, why are you in a wheelchair? And then I would lash out at them. How did, how did you lash out? I would just say, it's none of your business. I just felt like I was going to explode. It was a potent combination. Teenage angst coupled with trying to fit into a school where there were few minorities and no other disabled people. I remember those days after hearing the ninth period bell ring and all my friends were saying, I talk to you later, I'm going to soccer practice. I'll see you later, I'm going to football practice. And there I was with nowhere to go. And all I wanted to do was just fit in. One person would change all that. Middle school gym teacher Ron Croto saw something that even Rohan couldn't see. And so he asked Rohan to be a sports team manager, the first step in the coach's grand plan. One day before you know it, I had him doing pull-ups in class. Did like 30 or 40 pull-ups, so I always knew I was pretty strong. He said, oh, you know, I probably could do a lot more if I took my legs off. And I could see, you know, taking that weight off, he could really, you know, pull out a lot of pull-ups. In fact, Rohan did so well, he broke the school record for most pull-ups. It was then that Coach Croto talked him into becoming an athlete. A wrestler. And it was on the wrestling mat where Rohan, with half the body but twice the strength, found what had eluded him everywhere else, acceptance. To be honest with you, that was the best part, you know? The team camaraderie, it was like a second family. I just knew that wrestling was gonna take me somewhere where I've never been before. I know it was gonna give me a different life. Do you think you have an advantage? There aren't too many wrestlers without legs that you could go train with. <laughs> so I think that's definitely an advantage. <laughs> you can't practice, right? Exactly. <laughs> You're faster, you're more nimble, what is it? Uh, well, I think my biggest advantage was probably just my strength, you know? Because I was in such a lightweight class in high school, I wrestled 96 pounds. So you're wrestling kids who I assume most of them are not built like you are. Well, not an upper body at least. So you have this disability, but in fact, it advantaged Rohan Murphy. Yeah, definitely, you know? And the funny thing was, the more I excelled in wrestling, the more I excelled in life, whether it was socially or academically in school. So I really felt that wrestling just it took me to another level in my life. And to try to stay on that level, after Rohan graduated from high school, he went out for the wrestling team at Penn State. No one there had ever seen a legless wrestler before, certainly not the coach, who at first offered him a job as a bench assistant, not as a wrestler. And then I look at him and I'm like, I want to be on a team, I want to wrestle. And he's like, how would you wrestle? So I just whipped my legs off. 
hopped out of my chair and I showed him some handstand push-ups, that type of thing. This is not hard for you to do? No, it's just a flare. It's kind of a breakdancing move. So give me a move. Show, tell me the move you showed him. Well, I'm going to need you to stand up then. I'm so low to the ground and quick, I can just dive in here. Yeah. And get in a shot and take my opponent down. And he said to you what? Wow, that's incredible. Well, I think I probably had to lift my lift my uh, jaw up off the floor, but um, it was I was just like I was like my mind just started twirling like, man, what all can we? How can we do this? And sure you were enough, skeptical. I was skeptical, no doubt. But the skepticism quickly turned to amazement, and it wasn't just the college crowd that Rohan electrified. His just do it attitude caught the attention of Nike. In late 2008, I got contacted by somebody, and they were saying that Nike's looking for an athlete for for a New Year's Day campaign. Title, no excuses. It's written on the rainbow in letters made of gold. Written he quickly won them over, and what followed was a mind blowing TV commercial. They loved it. They were just like, you know, you know their jaw just dropped. They were laughing, they smiling, and they just thought it was amazing. Watch the donut, not the bowl. As for Rowan's personal life, at 26, he is now quite independent and also quite single. It turns out Rowan's shy. You can put me in front of uh, 500 kids and ask me to speak. That'd be easy. You can put me in front of one beautiful girl and I'd be like... <laughs> but he is anything but shy about his career. And as you can see, he has no trouble wowing an audience. Rowan has turned his personal triumphs into an inspirational message. He is now a motivational speaker. Thank you. I know I make... Doing those push-ups look easy, but unfortunately, my life hasn't been so easy, you know? I was born with a severe birth defect. So what do you think life. resonates with people when they hear your story? A lot of people take things for granted in life and maybe even having legs, and that's something that I don't have. And I just think it gives people a different perspective, especially kids. It really gave me a new perspective about how much hard work and dedication it really was going to take to become great at wrestling. And that's the way it is for life, for anything. Whether you want to be a state champ wrestler like I did when I was in high school, or you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, you know? I was really inspired. It's amazing what he went through. Well, he faced obstacles, but the obstacles did not stop him. He kept on going. Uh, he's got muscles, like, out to here. Like, it's awesome. You know, when you're a kid, you just want to be like everyone else. But now that I'm older and I'm wiser, you know, I know that being uh, disabled and having to deal with not having legs is a gift. And I have to use that gift to inspire and motivate others. Mm -hmm.